Uh, good afternoon, everyone, or uh, good day, everyone, depending on which time zone you join us from. Um, I am Flavio Pietrocola, I manage the Associate of Oliver White, and I have a great pleasure of welcoming today with us Albert Ross from uh, Mars, Iberia. Hello, everyone. This is Albert Ross. So, uh, uh, for those who joined us, um, the subject for this afternoon is going to be the journey to integrated business planning. Um, just to give you some uh, a brief outlook for what we're going to discuss. Actually, it's going to be much more Albert who uh, shares with all of us their experience in integrated business planning. Uh, there's going to be a few sections regarding to why uh, Mars Multi says Iberia starts the journey. Uh, what were the key challenges, how they got there, and then what are they doing to sustain the, the performance and improve it. And there will, there will be uh, some uh, polls during which you will be invited to vote uh, and share with us a bit about what your experiences are vis-a-vis -vis integrated business planning. Um, you can also, as you know, ask uh, us questions. Um, you can write those questions that come up on our um, board, our uh, desktop. Um, we cannot guarantee we'll answer all those questions um, live. However, we endeavor that uh, Albert or myself, we come back to you in due course. So you will, uh, you know, you will, your curiosity will be satisfied. So um, that's basically uh, all I'm going to say. If we just uh, get started. So, um, I don't know. I mean, we, we looked at who's participating, who's attending this webinar. We recognize lots of people. I believe some of you are already have already achieved a good level of integrated business planning performance. Others are just thinking about how to go about it or are right in the middle of it. We tend to think that uh, it's much more than a project. It's a journey. And therefore, it goes through different steps. So, um, you know, it is something that companies need to understand they need to own so companies talk about transformational experience in other words the organization really reorganize around integrated business planning um, there's obviously a focus on what improvements the business brings um, through ibp implementation uh, what tangible benefits are obtained through integrating all the business functions and so it is not just ticking the boxes in blueprint exercise is much more about actually delivering a much healthier and much more profitable business for your shareholders and yourself. And then, of course, since it's a journey, it goes through different steps. So Albert will be taking you through what it meant to achieve the first kind of milestone of the journey, which would be a, a good to excellent IVP process, but also what is happening next. So I will... Uh, Hand over to Albert now, who will uh, explain to you a bit about himself and the business he works for. Albert. Thank you, Flavio. It's a pleasure for me to participate in this webinar and, and to share with you guys and colleagues of the FMCG world a bit uh, what has been the experience in Wrigley uh, uh, in the past and now in uh, uh, about how we deployed our integrated business planning process. So a couple of slides for you to, to make an introduction of, of the company. Mars Incorporated is a Probably a bit different versus yours is a family-owned business. It's one of the biggest ones of MCG in the world, but not uh, owned by private equity. Uh, almost $35 billion uh, in sales. And we have in our portfolio $9 uh, billion brands and close to have the 10th the one uh, in the upcoming months. Uh, we are headquartered in McLean, Virginia, in the US. And we operate in uh, more than 80 countries in, uh, with more than uh, 420 sites, counting you know, business offices and, and factories uh, across the globe. And uh, if I have to highlight one uh, specificity of Mars Inc., we are uh, driven by our five principles, which uh, probably in all your uh, businesses and in all your companies, you also have your values too. But uh, take into account that this is a uh, a family on business, we are uh, really living these principles, quality, responsibility, mutuality, efficiency, and I would say one of the more differentiated ones, freedom, because we, we need to earn our freedom to continue being, being uh, 
uh, a private business uh, by the family. So that's that's very important for us. We are more than 100,000 employees around the world, and these are the principles that guide uh, our daily daily operations. About Mars Iberia, uh, we are operating in Mars Iberia in Spain since 1982 and in Portugal since 1990. Uh, around 300 million of turnover, more than uh, 55 million of uh, human consumers, let's say like this, and uh, more than 12 million of uh, pet cares that are um, consuming our, our products for them. Uh, three offices uh, nowadays headquartered in Barcelona, but we have also a commercial office in Madrid and in Lisbon, and we have more than 400 employees. Here you can see also in the picture some of uh, the brands that we that we have in our portfolio, probably most of them known by you, M&M's, Twix, Snickers, uh, Orbit, Skittles, uh, Uncle Ben's uh, on, the seg on the food segment, and we are also having at the pet care side, Pedigree, Caesar, Whiskas, Shiva, Probably they are they are brands that that you may know. So a glance in a glance uh, uh, slide of uh, what about me? I'm supply chain director on Mars Multicells Iberia uh, since uh, three years ago. Uh, I've been 14 years in the FMCG world, eight years uh, within Mars. At the beginning in Wrigley, and once Wrigley uh, moved into into Mars Incorporated at the worldwide level uh, in Mars. Uh, I'm a member of the Mars Iberian leadership team and also a member of the supply chain leadership team of Europe. Uh, and I have a combined career in project management and had also experience in sales and supply. I'm married and, and father of uh, two uh, young kids right now. Who will no doubt become consumers of your product. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Now we are, we are dealing at home to have a pet. This is my next, my next battle. So, What's IVP? I have tried here to summarize a bit uh, my definition and not the academic definition coming from Oliver Weiber at the end. For me, integrated business planning is, is the extension of the classical SNOP plus uh, process that was more involved in sales and supply in the 90s or beginning of the, of the 2000s and how we integrate with all the rest of the functions uh, a continuous process to deliver our business strategy through a customer and a portfolio demand process. I think that this is this is the key, how I will summarize uh, this, and probably you all know the, the steps of the classical uh, integrated business planning process, and it's something that we believe in and that we are running since uh, several years ago. So, um, thank you, Albert. Um, anyway, as, as I, you probably guess, but I mean, I'm sitting in uh, Mars multi Siberia head office in Barcelona, and I'm surrounded by chocolates and goodies. So unfortunately, we can't share them with you, <laughs> just the knowledge. But um, we will, I like, hope, you're all consumers of Mars. <laughs> yes. So um, let's get into a bit more detail. So you, you, um, you, you've seen the definition of best definition, actually the company's definition of IVP. Uh, I guess when we go into companies and we, you know, people talk to us about it it's almost like a no-brainer. People will say, well, integrated business planning is uh, common sense uh, formalized. Yeah, that's what it is. It's just doing the things that we do. Um, so why, why should we actually, why should we make it a project or a journey? What, what is different? What should drive us to go through, through this transformation? And sometimes those targets are not very immediate, not very intuitive. So I would like Albert to share with all of us what, what actually drove um, Wrigley at the time and yeah. what drives Mars now into continuing the integrated business planning journey. Yeah. There. yeah, so why we decided uh, as, as Wrigley to, to move into this uh, integrated business planning process, I would say mainly these four reasons you can see right now on the screen. The first one was we had an inconsistent business performance, I would say, around Europe, not only, not only in Spain at that moment of time. And, wh and what, what did that mean? Uh, for me, it was about not hitting targets, especially top line in the business. So we were uh, year after year not being able to reach our net sales value target. And this was a big issue because uh, our main strategy was uh, based on growth. And the second one was uh, the low level of predictability uh, linked to this uh, business performance. So not having 
the reliability to know what was going to happen, not only in the short, but also in the medium and long term. This was a, a, a constant issue that we had in our business, and this was one of the main reasons because of our change. Second one was that, and I experimented on my, you know, on, on, on my body, we had four sets of numbers in our business. We had a marketing team, uh, let me share with you, with a kind of joke, but the, a dreaming marketing team that at a certain point of the year, they were doing their plans, you know, growing plus five, plus 10, plus 15, uh, it happened in June, and then, you know, reality was completely different than, than what marketing was saying. Then we had a second reality that was the number of sales, really short, uh, really for the short term, just looking at the, at the upcoming three, maximum six months, and, you know, driving uh, their targets and, and, and their, their push to achieve them. Then we had a, a, a third number, which was the financial one, the one coming from the finance team that was the targets that we had since the beginning of the year and the commitments that we had with the region. And they were only, you know, managing reports against those numbers and, and still expecting, I would say, April, May, June, that, that those numbers would, would be delivered, even if the reality was uh, better or, or, or even if the reality was, was worse. And then we had the supply department that was mainly based into the historical data, trying to submit forecasts to the factory to make sure that the goods uh, were reaching our, our platforms and, and the, at the end, our customers, specifically for the short term. So it was really that we had four numbers in the company and that we were, when we were seated together, it was really impossible to understand uh, the reality of our business. And this was the second reason why we did it. Third one, we had poor service levels. And I would say maybe for some businesses having 93% of case fill, it's, I would say, acceptable, but not, not in the F FMCG world. Uh, so we had uh, around 93%, and, and we know the expectations here should be uh, above 97 or at least 98%. So this was also uh, critical in terms of uh, putting in place the IVP. And the fourth one, we, we wanted to have a, a, a complete transformation mindset in terms of how we forecast. Um, because all our people, mainly in sales, was forecasting in value. And, and this is not what we are producing, this is not what we are forecasting, and this is not what, what we are delivering to our customers. So uh, we had an issue at the base of our planning process uh, that we had also to, to change and to transform. These were, in a, in a, in a, in a summary, the main four reasons that uh, we decided to implement integrated business planning across the world. Uh, thank you, Bert. Now we move into the uh, the polling section. Um, what you see, what you should be seeing coming up on the screen now is typical um, reasons why you should be going or you should be considering implementing integrated business planning. You can see some would resonate to you as more typically supply chain, so customer service, uh, working capital, uh, including inventories, that would be one of the main drivers. Or you could be more strategic, uh, so much more brand marketing driven. Or you could be looking at it from an integration perspective, so how do we make sure all our people talk together by using one set of numbers? And then, of course, there's always the bottom line that, you know, it's uh, particularly for uh, publicly quoted companies, but as, you, as you've heard also, from us incorporated. I mean, that's always a, a sticky point. So um, I would like the polling to start and let's just, um, you know, hear about you, what your feelings are about these um, reasons why. Okay, so some of you are still still answering. Okay, that's great. Now we have. Uh, so most of you guys, uh, you think that 35% uh, of you think that. Uh, the, the top reason to implement is deliver strategy and growth targets. 
and 45% of you, so 10 more than the previous one, think that a top reason for you is to align functions, mainly sales, marketing, supply, and finance. Uh, as per my experience, and, and probably is what you've, you've heard in the previous slide, I think these are the top two, uh, to be honest, uh, on why uh, really at that moment of time and, and Mars right now decided to run uh, their business uh, through IBB. It's about uh, making sure that we look forward and that this way of looking forward helps us to deliver strategy and growth and having, you know, a unique set of numbers with a unique way of working between the, I would say, the, the four core departments in the, in the business. From, uh, from my perspective, this is Flavio speaking now, I think this is um, some very promising results because if you were into like basic sales operations planning or into business planning, uh, I guess we'll be seeing more uh, supply chain oriented results you now, Albert. Yeah. So I think you're telling us that you're really looking now at your next uh, stage in in the journey. So well done. Yeah. Okay, so um, we move on to now the actual um, journey. Um, one of the key points is, well, who's actually owning the process? You know, ideally, we would say it's the leadership team, it's the company's president, it's the executive committee, uh, it's those people who really need to make a difference and walk the talk in the business. But then, of course, it's everyone. Like, you know, IVP, the business process, it's not just uh, the dream or the ambition of a few. So, again, Albert, um, what were your uh, what were your learning points? What were your takeaways when you yeah. when you go when you decided to go private. I think that uh, main main steps that really at that moment of time uh, did to ensure a, a right uh, deployment and in terms of owning the process uh, inside the business was first of all to make a global or I would say here a regional European deployment and uh, a leadership team by in so all the teams in Europe in all units and in all markets uh, you know had uh, the, the objective to deploy this process as a new way we we, we we wanted to run the business. Um, I think it's critical that the GM visibly owns the process, not only in the management business review, but also you know in in some other forums that probably you may have in your in your in your in your businesses or communications. Making sure that the GMs talks about the process, talks about the importance of having it integrated, and making sure that all functions uh, are working are working. Uh, along it. We made, a, in terms of so organizational design, we made a couple of uh, interventions there. Um, we appointed a European SNOP director that was um, directing, so, so, right, reporting directly, sorry, to the, to the president of Wrigley Europe at the moment of time. So making sure that the deployment was being made um, to all countries and with, uh, you know, a, a severity in terms of importance really high. And in every single unit, we had um, uh, a new figure, an SNOP manager, which was the role that I, that I had at that moment of time, that uh, we were uh, also uh, directly reporting to the GM of every single unit. So just making sure that this was not, as Flavio said before, a supply topic or, or, or a standing alone uh, topic. It was more about uh, a business, a business topic. A four, a four piece, which I think was uh, was not easy at the beginning, to be honest, uh, was to replace the old meetings because at the end, uh, intensity of uh, making the IVP wheel uh, run, it's high. We're having five five important meetings, uh, product uh, portfolio management review, demand management review, supply chain management review, integrated reconciliation and management and management review. Five meetings that are, as I said, really intense. And and what we had to do is to close, stop with our old way of running the business. And at, at the beginning we had some, I would say detractors on this, uh, but we had to do it in a kind of a hard call because if not, it uh, was very difficult to, to manage the implementation. And at the beginning also, because the transformation, it's not it's not easy and you need uh, quite a lot of time to make sure that the, that the process starts uh, running in the right way. Uh, we first attack our our demand review with the demand man management review meeting, and making sure that the, this core or this heart of the process, I would say, was uh, running at an acceptable level. 
And second one, just securing that this demand planning process or demand management process was feeding uh, the conversations and the decisions that the leadership team at, at that moment of time uh, had to take in the in the management model in Italy. These were the two critical points that we need to trigger at the beginning and to put more focus uh, beyond, you know, extending excellence and quality of the other steps. And also an important topic to make sure that we own it was uh, to get some quick wins. And my role as SNOP Plus uh, manager was to make sure that uh, that we share, you know, those months or those periods that uh, we were having a right level of predictability in the business to show it and to show that this was a benefit of implementing um, IVP or, for example, making sure that the, in the management business review, we were taking decisions coming from other steps. So making sure that uh, the whole business was, uh, was understanding the benefits that implementing an IVP had and, and securing that, that these benefits were shared uh, in, all, in all positions and in all departments. And last but not least, I was trying also to create a kind of positive rivalry, I would, I would uh, say like this, uh, just making sure that, for example, the, the, the DMR or the guys that were running the DMR, I uh, was pushing them uh, uh, in terms of benchmarking, saying that those guys of PMR are doing a great job, are, are operating with a lot of assumptions, are, are doing the things in the right way. Why don't you, you know, start stealing with pride uh, the essence of what they are doing just to make sure that you put your step in the right lane. So making sure that this uh, positive rivalry was there uh, to increase the level of excellence of every one of the single steps, specific, especially I would say at the beginning where, you know, uh, at some moments you feel that you are in a tunnel uh, and that there is no light uh, at the end of that. We have a question coming from Declan. So Declan, will you know? Hello. Thank you for your question, Declan. So the question is, why why were your titles SNOP and not IBP? Yeah, good question. To be honest, at the beginning, what we decided to call it SNOP Plus, and, and that's the main reason why, you know, the in terms of organizational design, the roles were, were called SNOP. Uh, at the end, you know, when, when having some uh, sessions, uh, in that case with Oliver White, with Flavio, we understood, you know, more massively that uh, IVP was a kind of evolution that we wanted to run the business of the, I would say, the old SNOP process, you know, involving specifically finance, having financial reviews in the IR and the MBR. Uh, we, we could have changed it, but at that moment of time, you know, we, we kept the, the names as, as, we, as we set it up at the beginning. Uh, what, for example, in all our decks and in our, all our folders in, in, in our paths were, were called IBM or IVP in that case, yeah. Good question. Uh, I think, uh, from memory, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Albert, I think Mars had also uh, their own SNP process yes, in place. Yes, at the moment, yeah. And because there was there were already some connections, so for example, at the time we, we ran the project here, Wrigley was already distributing Mars products uh, in certain categories for Spain. So I guess, the, you know, to provide some continuity, we, uh, yeah, we accepted that SNP yeah. would be the, the name. However, uh, and it might be might seem strange to some people, but um, for some companies who have gone through initial SNOP projects, which were at the time very supply chain driven, even a change in acronym um, resonates differently to say the marketing. So sometimes, and it might just look and sound like a bit of marketing, but actually a change in acronym and a change in the project position, it does engage people who would have thought this was very much yeah. short term supply balancing. All right. So, you know, a bit of marketing, a bit of history, but again, Declan, good question, and don't be surprised. I mean, in France, some people will still call it PIC, Plan Industriel mm. Commercial. Some company might call it SIOP, Sales Inventory and Operations Planning. Some company might call it Integrated Business Management. At the end of the day, it's really what you want to get from it, and is that the right one for you? Yeah. So let's move on. There's more stuff coming from uh, yeah. Albert. So one critical uh, step that I put in place in, in, in the organization, and I think it was around uh, after one year of implementing, was a kind of self-assessment according what I call the behavior line. And what I have tried to put is people in front of me, you know, in, with conversations one-to-one -one with some of the managers and some of the key stakeholders uh, involved there on how do I feel and how do they feel that they were across 
the IDD, IDD process. And I, I, I separate these uh, four states, I would say. The first one is the people who doesn't know about IDP and how company operates, probably the new ones uh, or the ones that haven't, hasn't been trained there. Second one, the ones that uh, understand what is IDP, but they don't care about the process and that they are, I would say, against it. And those are the ones that we have to repair and, and that I had to repair at that moment of time with, you know, some crucial conversations, understanding main reasons behind this, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, this way of not accepting the way that the business was, was uh, supposed to be run. Third bucket or third uh, group of people that were supporting the process, but that they did not have enough proactivity within the process. So um, just to put an example, I, I would say, and Flavio, Flavio knew it, my first year at job, I was doing a lot of things, even beyond SNLP manager, because I was doing things that for me, uh, it was supposed to be done by other stakeholders in the business. And until you make this change or this click in their minds, uh, that even they support the process, but they are not as proactive uh, as they should be to, to be the feeders of the information and the decisions, et cetera, et cetera. And the four ones, the, the ones that active and proactive, that have active and proactive participation in the business. So I recommend you, especially to those that are in a, not in a, in a very, that those, those of you that are in a, in the very first step of implementation, that at some point you, you make a reflection according to this uh, behavior line and, and could have good conversations with, with your teams to make sure that they move uh, at the right side of the, of the, I, of the would, um, I would also add that um, don't underestimate the effort to take to um, go through steps one and two. Yeah, no, it's not easy. Because again, uh, most people say, yeah, of course we do IVP, well, well then they miss some of the, the key points and therefore they actually don't know what they don't know. And until those people know what they don't know, they don't express a need to knowing more and and you cannot actually make the move from like silent majority, perhaps to people who don't like it, but say that. And once you know that they don't like, but say things about it, then we can start treating those things that they're against. Um, and then you can start moving them towards the supporters. So it is a, it is a, a process that takes many months, um, well beyond just describing the basic business flows, because yeah. it actually means changing and uh, adapting people's behaviors to a new way of doing business. Absolutely. Thank you, Flavio. So, we continued also with, uh, with uh, at the beginning, and especially I would say in the big markets, like, like Spain, it was in, in at the moment of time, we, we get uh, support from Oliver White and, and some uh, uh, good days in terms of training and having these conversations from outside the business that help us to move forward. But we also need to organize internally with uh, a team of European uh, coaching, uh, coaching coaches, sorry, of SNOP Plus or IVP, uh, uh, where you know some of our, the SNOP managers that have been appointed across across Europe were helping the other markets to move further into into our journey. And I think that this was a very good, a very good uh, initiative that we had at that moment of time to help uh, small units to move to move further. Uh, we also made our our Point of creating our own Europe, European vision, just to make it to make it more tangible and to and to feel it more more real at that moment of time with our key principles, our logo, and uh, and with the stakeholder engagement communication pack, you know, to help uh, people understand that this was not a process coming from outside the business that we had to apply. It was our process, so we understood the standards, we understood the idea, but then you know we define it. With the way that also was was uh, working and was was making sense uh, for us. There's a question from Alexander of uh, Coca-Cola France. We start the journey, Albert. We start the journey. You'll have it in, in a couple of slides, but again, I can summarize. We start the journey in 2010. Uh, in 2010, uh, at a European uh, level, uh, it has been uh, decided to to change the way we we run our business. And, and to deploy the, the integrated business planning process across across Europe in Wrigley. But it took several times, you will see it later, to, to get or to reach what we call this business uh, business excellence level. And also um, for Alexander and everyone, uh, my memories were that uh, in 2010, Spain was pretty much uh, into recession. 
yeah. uh, consumer goods uh, like chewing gum, so they were considered to be the luxury of consumer goods. So we were facing a pretty tough situation in terms of marketplace, in terms of revenue. And, you know, um, I would say that it's not easy, but it's certainly easier to implement integrated business planning where the business is flying. We started here in, the, at the, you know, at the moment. bottom of the recession, and that was tough, but at the same time very motivating yeah. because actually to get out of that and become much more reliable and actually trust your numbers when uh, previously it was just, you know, there was declining sales without any kind of bottoming out in place. I think that was great, and yeah. we could see that about a year later. I yes. Guess. So um, time for a bit of polling now. Okay, so you've heard a bit about um, um, Albert and Mars uh, uh, sales Iberia story. What do you think? Uh, what, what do you know would be your uh, your key um, IVP ownership challenges? So is it, as Albert said, getting the management to walk the talk? Is it making sure that this is really strategically sales and marketing led? Is it perhaps? Taking down some big side of behavior, some you know, some independent republics within the business, just making sure that functions collaborate with it, with each other, and any other you might think of. And if not, you can always ask questions while there. So let's let's have the polling start. Yeah, okay. Well. Thank you, guys. 43% of you answered uh, about the defensive and silo behaviors, and the second one was 26% of you uh, talk about uh, the getting top management support. I would, I would, to be honest, answer the same, but in a, in a you know, with different position. I see that the most difficult, if we do not have support of the top management, it's more than sure that this will not work. Uh, whereas I agree that once you have the top management support, the big difficult piece is to make sure that all functions do not have these defensive uh, behaviors and that they play, uh, you know, in, in a transparent way to, to make sure that the, that the process uh, runs in an appropriate way. But thank you guys for, for your answers here. Okay, so we'll move on. A bit more details about the actual implementation of that. What you, did you do to, to get where you wanted to? Yeah, as I was answering to you, Alexander, we, we started in 2010 in, in Europe, and uh, we didn't end up until 2013 to have, I would say, most of our units, and I would even say not all, but most of our units in Europe at, at what we call a capable level or, or this uh, uh, excellent uh, business level that we, that we decided uh, to achieve when we started this journey with uh, also the help of, of Oliver White. Here you can see, for example, in 2011, as I said before, that we did a lot of training sessions around Europe, more than 300 employees trained, uh, more than 50 SNOP Plus or IBM champions uh, were appointed, and uh, the, 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 the journey took, took along, and, uh, and we, we reached this, uh, let's say, uh, status or, or level of or being capable or mature enough in IVP in 2013. In the majority of our of our countries. I think there's an interesting question out there for you from uh, Nathalie Morandi. Uh, question is, do you do you think you would apply the same process for small countries, limited number of resources? Like, would you still plan to run the five meetings? What were your experience in yeah. Europe? Because you did have big yeah. and small units. Yeah, yeah. So Spain was a big was a big unit, but I was doing coaching, for example, for a region that we call uh, uh, Balkan Balkan West, and and I went, you know, to Slovenia, Croatia, such a small market at that uh, moment of time with limited resources, as you said. But the principles we were applying it uh, in a, in a pretty similar way. So I think that for small units. You need to define what works, what doesn't work. I would skip, you know, having more or having a chairman 
of uh, different steps. So sorry, having the same chairman for different steps, I think that is this is not the right approach. Although I know that it's that could be difficult in small units. And and what I would try to here guide you is about making it as simple as you could, especially if you have uh, not a lot of resources. You know, you can have uh, very long decks uh, created by a lot of uh, people inside a business, but probably in these small units, you need less information, more relevant, but you know, ensuring that the wheel is working in a similar way that it's working in, in, in the big ones. And as we read another question from yeah. Chris Karras, how do you transition from the legacy top management process, MBR, to MVP, IBP? Uh, we're not sure, Chris, we understand the question because MBR, according to uh, Mars and many companies' um, uh, language, is the uh, management business reviews, which actually closes the IBP cycle, cycle. off week four or five. So, um, well, I think if I get a question, I understand it's how we make the shift or the change between our old management review business to the new, you know, way of managing uh, the business through IVP. I think that the, ma the main trigger here, the, or the main point to unlock a situation specifically with top management was when we were looking forward and when in that case, GM was understanding that we were running the cycle to close our targets. And at the end to achieve the sooner the better, a right projection, you know, in top line, but not all, not only in top line, but also in bottom line. So, and that month after month, the management business review was forward looking and not looking at the past and understanding those gaps and getting, you know, uh, some consistency on how we were closing the gap. And maybe some years, and I think that Flavio, you were here those tough times, we weren't able to close the gap for the current year. But you know, this enabled us conversations to say, okay, what we should cut this year, at least to secure our earnings, because we know, or we are pretty sure that we won't be able today in April or in May uh, to get the top line this year. And you know, by making sure that we make these trade-offs forward looking, at some point we were being able also to concentrate in year plus two, and also to manage our stakeholders regionally, you know, presidents, Europe, etc., on how the business will look like uh, this year. Yeah, from memory, Albert, I can actually pin it down to a specific year. I remember we were in uh, probably October, and you were discussing an advertising campaign whether you should cut it or you should roll it to the following year. And uh, I think I noticed a change in the mindset because previously. The business would have gone into bottom line um, protection, yeah. whereas with now a rolling horizon, you began to ask yourself questions about, well, yeah, but guys, we're not just investing for this year end, we're actually investing for the following year. And that drove a totally different decision. And then I also remember a point in time, corporate came back to you and actually lowered some of uh, the expected results for the following year because yeah. they realized that Spain being where it was, you actually needed to uh, take a breath, stop and think about where we're going. And so yeah. they actually took the pressure off you, didn't they? Yes, it happened one, one of the years, uh, you're right, Flavio, that at some point uh, that this, the easy decision was to cut, but at that moment of time we decided not to cut because we were having a much more rolling mentality. Well, for example, in some other years, you know, the pressure of that year takes you to, to make that, that cut. But at the end is make decisions uh, for the future with the current projections that you are having every single cycle. So we just take one more question and then uh, we, we need to uh, move forward. So Gabor is asking, um, is actually asking if I can read correctly. Uh, hold on. I guess the question is about what tools did you use? Um, for IVP implementation, was it specifics or was it Excel? At the beginning, we didn't have uh, great tools, uh, to be honest. Uh, and I think that the tools are more that is related uh, uh, to demand demand management review because at the end, for MBR, for INR, for PMR, not big tools uh, are there in terms to 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 better manage the work. At the beginning, 
we had our planning processes, but they had no, you know, big intelligence, big analytics. We were just overwriting data there, according our 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 assumptions and our our plans that we were agreeing, you know, between uh, sales guys and demand planners. So I, just to answer you, I see that we started somehow with Excel. Now we make some evolutions. We have some uh, some um, forecasting tools uh, that help us uh, to run the DMRs and specifically to have a, a robuster long term. Uh, but we started uh, from scratch with Excel, I would say. Yeah, and actually, it's more about the behaviors and it's more about the transformation. I think that the tools will not help us, exactly. will not help you to to make the step change in IBD. So don't make Gabor, don't make um, don't make the fact that you're not having the best. Uh, uh, ERP in the world uh, a prevent you from going for IBP because we would say that's more of an excuse. <laughs> okay, so the main challenges, and I think that uh, this could be a good slide uh, because probably uh, some of you are, are there. Uh, the main one, or the first one, was to have clear roles and responsibilities. As we change completely the, the way of running our business, we have to define clearly who does what and when. Um, by you know understanding responsibilities of every single IVP step, and securing the role of what what does the chairman do, what the chairman does, sorry, uh, what a facilitator a facilitator does, and uh, what is the kind of collaboration needed between the steps to make sure that this that this is working properly. We had a second uh, challenge that it was uh, hidden agendas and I remember several months at the beginning that people was not showing the truth as they know it you know uh, uh, people that was thinking that something would happen but they were they were not sharing it in our in our pre DMR meetings or, or in our DMR meetings and and at the end we were having big deviations uh, specifically the first the first months uh, of the implementation and this was a uh, wrong behavior that we had to that we had to tackle and and remove we had to make as said before, this big transformation in, in sales forecast, uh, we were forecasting the passing value, so in kind of invoiced, uh, uh, in, yeah, in invoice sales, and we had to move it to volume. So how many cases, how many tons you are going to to sell, and then we will transform these tons and these cases to to the value to understand how this uh, is driving our net sales. But this was a big challenge, and, and I'm sure you remember that this took this took, this took time. Uh, behavioral bias elimination, another big bucket, because at the beginning, you know, people was kind of, uh, uh, okay, we will achieve our targets, let's forecast, and we were starting to have an over-forecasting behavior in the business. And, you know, once the managers and the president and the GM was pushing and saying, guys, what the hell are you doing? You're not achieving your targets. Then behavioral shifted into the, op the opposite side to under-forecast. You know, this mentality is of over-promise and uh, uh, and under, under deliver. Under deliver. So, so at the end, it was a, it it took time to to find the balance and a and a, and a, and a medium point there. Defensive behaviors as a growth taller. Uh, people at some point also thought that, uh, okay, if I put numbers this cycle for you know in in a couple of months and they are low and I achieve it, this is gonna be a good new. But at the end, this is this is something. Okay, good for the really short term, but it's not good for the long term because at the end we have an annual target and we have a, an annual strategy uh, in three years that we need to deliver. So, how we secure that uh, our short term plan is accurate, but we also put things in place to make sure that we close the gap for the long term. And this was uh, something that that was uh, not easy at the beginning. Transforming the process into a stage and process, specifically in a step one in portfolio management review, uh, you know, by using assumptions, using several steps that we decided uh, to use for innovation, renovation, and promo planning, and putting a bit of, you know, standardization behind uh, to something that in the past was was a complete mess. And last but not least, I would say that one of the most uh, difficult things to plan was this business rolling mentality. You know? These uh, marketing plans once a year, this big moment that we're having in June or in September, forget about this. If this is rolling, your plans are being built in uh, every single month, you know, since uh, January, February, March, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So um, these were mainly the challenges we had, uh, I would say, during uh, one year, one year and a half, 
that some of them you know were cutted at the beginning and some others took took more time to to make the real the real change so talking to uh, talking about clear roles and responsibilities another good question from Declan it says what is the definition of an SNOP champion and how were they selected good question uh, I think that in terms of uh, skills for selection was more was more people who was uh, understanding the business in a global way I think that uh, this is this is needed because if it's really functional uh, for probably the implementation would be a bit biased so having uh, people that understands business as a whole you know it's marketing it's sales it's supply it's finance it's P&O it's IT it's a good uh, a good criteria for selection uh, second one I would say it's somebody that it's really transparent and with no hidden interest because at the end uh, to deploy and to implement the, the, the process the SNOP manager has to has to think in the business mainly you know and the business align properly with the GM but making sure that uh, that the business moves into the right direction and not a certain function so uh, I think that uh, the, the person needs to have this capacity of, of being transparent uh, balanced and not uh, shift into into one function and uh, there's another question oh, yes. from Edward Caribos which is directed to Oliver White but I guess you can also Albert you can answer the question because you're a multinational but you're actually a family business yes so it's interesting how how would you how would you relate IVP to a family business well it's a good it's a good question because well we, we are family owned business but in terms, of scale, in terms of scale, it's really, uh, you've seen it at the beginning, it's 1,000 uh, employees in the business. So, uh, my, my opinion or my guidance here would be, if it's a family-owned business, a small one, probably need a very good conversation, you know, between the sisters, the fathers, whoever owns that business, to make sure that this is something that, uh, that, that you want to implement, because IVP means tough conversations at the moment of time because if things are not working properly uh, you need to face it and you need to show it and uh, some people sometimes is not prepared to you know to, to see some some realities that the, that, the, that the business can show not in the past but in the future for me it's, here's the key topic so uh, I would say prepare for good conversations before implementing uh, this kind of uh, IV or this IVP process into you know a smaller familiar business because if not you know the tension can be really really high. I also think Edward um, if it's the business I think you're thinking of in Russia um, personally I I do work um, in southern Europe and as you probably know there are lots of smallish family businesses in southern Europe even it might be family but smallish. What's the difference between a multinational national and a family business where actually when you reach a certain size I wouldn't see too much the only probably advantage is in a family business if the boss says yes things move much quicker however you might come across some behaviors which are somewhere somewhat more uh, evident than in multinational where processes yeah. and procedures are more embedded into the organization yes 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 yeah, in family business things are less organized or less uh, less process driven and this can have uh, uh, an additional uh, an additional thing to to be to be stored there okay so uh, back to polling now um, we had a some good conversation a question about implementation challenges how would you feel about yours the polling starts Okay, so most of you guys, 53% of you, uh, answer that uh, 
behavioral transformation of key process stakeholders is uh, the top uh, IVP implementation challenge. And the second one with 32% of the of the votations, the vote, sorry, it's uh, about long-term planning uh, uh, aligned to strategy, which which I would uh, completely agree also in the, in the order. I think that uh, this transformation in the whole business in terms of processes, behaviors, stakeholders, and, and people, it's, it's really the, the, the challenge, I would say, in bold. Good. So um, let's just uh, uh, there's a question now from Michael. Um, I think the question is, do you also extend the IBP process across the company borders, i.e. towards your key suppliers? Uh, so in terms of process, to be honest, the answer is no. In terms of, you know, the lead times that we have agreed into our process, the answer is yes. So, you know, if, if, if in terms of, uh, for example, our replenishment process, we have agreed and decided through our ADP that, uh, you know, some of the raw materials or the ingredient or the, the way we are uh, measuring our, for example, our sales forecast accuracy, not only in the markets, but also in terms of the, at the production side, take, you know, whatever months is what, you know, we, we, we ask to our suppliers to be able to deliver with those lead times, but not in terms of the whole problem, only in terms of the lead times. And also, I think uh, for information, uh, um, my guess is most of the, um, the source was actually internal, is actually internal. They have your own factories at now. Yes, yeah, we're on. And so it, it, it goes through some collaboration between internal partners, but you would not see uh, a lot of third party sourcing mm -hmm. like you might see. You know, we know the companies coming from the Far East or, or India or low cost countries. Okay, let's let's move on then. So it's about now, okay, um, Albert mentioned to you uh, there is a certification which companies will so require obtain from Oliver White. Um, so what were again the, the key points or the key boxes you had to tick to, to get there? Yeah, so, so in terms of behavioral and process perspective and just highlighting the the toughest uh, requirements that we had to achieve and that took that took time was with this real real long term focus several times we were a bit biased you know by the current year especially if or specifically if uh, things were not uh, were not going well or business performance was not as expected and making this mindset shift on talking about this uh, uh, rolling 18 24 months in the business was something that uh, was not easy to unlock, but we finally achieved it. Accepting this concept of truth as we know it was uh, really, really important uh, uh, to deploy and was not easy at the beginning. Using the cycle to take decisions because uh, at the beginning was, you know, we were opening the questions in the meetings and we were designing outside the meetings and this was not the right approach. We need to be prepared here, you know, with the options, A, B, C, the scenarios, and then we decide in every single meeting of the of the process. So using it decisively and not as an uh, opening questions. And and finally, as said before, running the, the business uh, in a rolling way. But also to get this certification, uh, we had to deliver some results, which at the end, you can put the process in place, but if the results are not there, something is wrong. Uh, and these were the KPIs that we were managing. Forecast accuracy at the at the demand side, at the single SKU level. So achieving a, a, the right level of of sales forecast accuracy was was tough, but but uh, we did it and we sustained it time over time. The forecast bias in terms of the behavior. Again, if we are always over, over forecasting or under forecasting, achieve a, you know a medium point. And finding out this balance was was uh, was not easy, but was key to get this certification. Start working with this uh, staging it process and achieve uh, a certain level in terms of uh, gates on time with the approvals of the projects and making sure that we were not stretching the whole supply chain when launching innovation or or making any single promotional activation. And then we also define a kind of you know April May making sure that our year-end estimations of the year were not varying so much or changing so much versus this, this estimation that we had in April, May, which at the end was talking about the robustness of the process and, and the figures. Actually, just a quick comment on this. 
when you think about the um, Mars journey, there weren't actually that many KPIs you had to fix, but the focus was really on the commercial ones, as as you can see. And you know, but it took some time to yeah. to, to get them right. But let's now move on to. So you got it right. You became capable. What's happened since? So um, let's look now at sustaining yeah. the journey of that. So for me, this is a very good sentence to use uh, in your in your units or in your businesses. We are what we repeatedly do. So excellence at the end is not it's not an act, but an act, but a habit. And and I think this is an Aristotle. A sentence, but I think it's really appropriate when when trying to implement a process like like IBT and and then, then right. you can use it. So things that we need to sustain it because uh, after you know 2013 a lot of things happen and also you know internal integration happening in Mars, a lot of people coming out uh, or moving out and coming in into the business. So we need to secure our onboarding processes to make sure that that the process keeps keeps uh, uh, going on as we define it. Uh, we also had to create a kind of knowledge database to make sure you know all this information was there and making sure that every single uh, person that was coming to the business had the chance to read it down and, and reflect on it and also ask questions about that. Uh, embedding right behaviors when critical roles were moving and thinking you know on chairmen, facilitators, this kind of critical roles in the in the process. Uh, so making sure that uh, when a new sales director, a new marketing director was coming, had the right conversation with them to make sure that uh, we didn't uh, step out on the process. We uh, we have organized ourselves to do internal IDP audits to keep, you know, the momentum and this uh, and this uh, level that we that we reached in the past and also by doing continuous improvement plans. I think that this is critical. And as I explained before, we also have been uh, evolving in terms of our forecasting process by using new analytical tools that help us to uh, to extend in a more automatic way our demand uh, demand management uh, review or demand management plan in that case. So a very quick polling, if anyone's still uh, prepared to go through it, on uh, uh, what would you regard as your challenges for sustaining IVP? All stars, please. Okay, thank you guys. So 63% of you uh, think that uh, the top challenge to, to sustain it to embed IDP culture so it becomes a way of life. And uh, and with 23%, it's uh, the not to be drawn back into my short-term planning, which uh, I fully agree with you. These are the, the two main areas uh, to keep an eye to sustain this uh, year over year. So, and, and just to finish it, uh, final reflection from my side, and we and we'll close. Uh, because after several years of working with IDP, I started in 2010, and now it's uh, 20, 2018. I would say this is the power of lock, of, of forward looking. And and at the end, it's not about thinking on the past, what uh, my brand did in the past, etc. It's about trying to project the future with the best assumptions and take decisions with this with these pictures that we are showing every single month. I think that the power of having this it's it's really high. Second one, it's the power of gap closing because once we look forward in a in a transparent way and we face reality, then is when we put when we can put teams to work on a plan uh, to close those gaps and make sure that we achieve all our single targets in the business. Facing reality, even you know the, the figures that we see here, the conversations we have to uh, to handle in our meetings are are tough. We need to make it, we need to face reality, and then, as I said before, we need to put actions uh, to improve it and 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 to and to and to make sure that our businesses achieve our our desired results. And at the end, is the power of accountability. Uh, this is not about you know blaming the other step; it's about working in a combined way and making sure that all steps are 
working for the same purpose, for the same objective, which at the end is the one that has to be defined by the by the management team, the management business review. So it's a way to break all the silos, break all the functional hats, and making sure that we that we work in in the in a process way and not in a functional way. So thank you very much, Albert, for uh, spending this very, very rich hour uh, with us. Thank you all for uh, uh, being with us and uh, some very interesting questions. Uh, I know we had some more questions that we couldn't answer uh, directly, but I'm sure uh, Albert will be willing to do that. So thank you very much again for your time. And uh, yeah, stay tuned on IBP. Thank you, guys.